Welcome to a short video on the functioning of the switch matrix in a pinball machine. I decided to do this video to explain the purpose of a switch matrix as well as the reason for the diodes and the capacitors in the matrix. This video is based on a Bally pinball machine running a Dash 35 MPU, but the concepts work for other applications like Arduinos and other pinball machines. This was based on a question posted in the comments. I welcome your comments and feedback. Give a thumbs up or thumbs down and subscribe to see more videos. Let's start by looking at how you would interface a single switch with a microcontroller. The top two pictures show a normally low line that goes high with a switch press, and the bottom two pictures show a normally high line that goes low with a switch press. There's really no difference to the microcontroller, and neither is better than the other. In the top left, we have a switch tied to 5 volts and a CPU signal line tied to the ground through a resistor to keep the signal from floating. When the switch is closed, 5 volts is now connected to the CPU input pin. The CPU can then take action on this event. In the bottom left, we have a pin tied to 5 volts through the resistor and the switch tied to ground. When the switch closes, it then brings the pin potential to ground and again the CPU can take action on this. In the case of a pinball machine, we aren't really tied directly to a CPU, but rather through a peripheral interface adapter, or PIA, like a 6821 or 6820 in the case of Bally and Stern solid state machines. The first question is often asked, why a matrix? Well, if we connected the switches directly, as in the previous example, we would have an issue with resources. You would need one pin for every switch. This would not scale well. Even with a modest 20 switches, a single 6821 PIA does not have enough pins. As you can see, the last four switches would have nowhere to be connected. I've left off the pull-down resistors in this picture to prevent the drawing from getting too cluttered. In this image, we've rearranged the switches in a matrix. In this case, we have five rows and four columns. This means that to support the same number of switches as the last example, 20, we are only using nine pins, easily within the capacity of a single 6821. With this type of arrangement, a single PIA could scale to 64 switches using an 8x8 matrix. In operation, the way this works is the system sends out a pulse on each column in turn. At the same time, it is listening on the rows to see if any switches are closed. In this way, it can determine which switch is closed by looking at the intersection of the row and the column. In real life, this scanning is happening hundreds to thousands of times per second. Okay, so I wanted to throw a little aside in here and talk about the actual frequency. I said it can take do hundreds to thousands of times per second, the actual scanning of those um, pins. I wanted to actually get a regular measurement. Now, if you look at the oscilloscope, I'm tied into the, uh, the 40, 42 volt or whatever it is, 41 volts coming into the system, 43 volts actually, I think it is. Um, and this feeds what's called the zero crossing detector. Now there's another video I watch about a guy that was doing a, a Bally Stern operating system for an Arduino, and he said that the scanning rate was 120 times per second. And that would make sense if they were using the zero de crossing detector circuit as the output for this. So if I take and disconnect from the input, and you saw our 120 hertz D pulsing DC here. But if I disconnect this and I go over to the output of all of this, which is on pin 4 of this, am I reading that wrong one? It's on the wrong pin. And we see I got our pulse every 120 hertz, uh, 120 times a second. And that is feeding into this, the chip um, U10 that does the scanning of the um, switches. However, if I connect up here, and pin 2 is the first pin of our scanning sequence here and you'll see let's auto oops let's stay on the pin it helps ah maybe 
you'll see that we're actually scanning at a rate of uh, 1.6 to 1.7 kilohertz, so 1600 to 1700 times per second. So although that 120 hertz is being fed into that chip, I don't know what it's being used for programmatically. I haven't de uh, reverse engineered the program yet. Um, but it's pretty clear that the scan cycle on these is actually closer to uh, one and a half to 1.75 kilohertz um, when it's scanning for switch hits. So just wanted to do that quick little aside and show you what, uh, what the actual scan rate was on this particular MPU. And with that, we will move on. Now let's slow this down so we can see what's happening. In this case, drop target C has been hit, and that switch is now closed. When the PIA sends out a pulse on PA0, one of its pins, it gets a pulse back on PB1. This tells this drop target tells it that drop target C has dropped, and can then send an interrupt to the CPU to handle the scoring of this event. The next pulse goes out, but nothing is received back. Even though drop target C is still down, the pulse is not on that column. On the next pulse, the ball hits bullseye 1 on the playfield. The PIA sees the pulse back on PB1 and can tell that in this case the bullseye is the switch. Again, it notifies the CPU to handle the scoring and event processing. The next pulse goes out on PA3 and no pulse is received back. The next pulse circles back to PA0 and now drop target B is down. This means that both PB1 one and PB2 will receive pulses. The PIA does its notifications and the CPU handles the events. The next pulse out goes out with no return pulses. The next pulse goes out PA2 and is heard back on PB2, indicating the hitting of bullseye 2. Events are triggered and points are scored. Now this seems great, but why do we have diodes in front of the switches? Well, the diodes only let current travel in one direction. Without them, in this matrix, a PIA would have trouble understanding which switches were actually closed. For example, in this diagram I've removed the diodes and shown a play field that has both drop targets B and C down and the ball has just struck bullseye 1. Without the diode, current travels backwards through the drop target C switch and through the drop target B switch. The PIA would see both PB1 one and PB2 pulse in combination with its output on PA2 which would make the PIA think that both bullseye 1 and bullseye 2 had been hit as those are the switches at the intersection of PA2 and PB1 and 2. For this reason you, ha you have to have diodes in line with the switches. Knowing how this works can also help in troubleshooting. If a diode has failed open that switch won't work at all. And if the diode has failed closed you might find that hitting one switch causes another unrelated points to be scored. Finally, the capacitors on the switches are on some of the switches are critical. You'll notice that they are not on all of the switches. They will be on switches that can activate quickly and disconnect quickly. They're, they are there because even electrons have momentum and may not react fast enough to the switch closing. When a switch closes with the capacitor attached, the capacitor can release its stored energy quickly, making sure the event is seen by the PIA. Slower actuating switches like wire rollovers and drop targets don't need them as a switch will stay closed long enough to be seen by the PIA. I hope this short video has been educational. I thank you for watching. Again, like, subscribe, and comment. I will see you in the next video.